Right. Good morning. I welcome members to the fifth meeting in 2016 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. As always, ask members to switch off mobile phones, please. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed we take item nine, which will allow the committee to consider the evidence received on the Land and Buildings Transaction Amendment Scotland Bill uh, now uh, in private. Do we agree to do that, please? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item two, instruments subject to affirmative procedure, the Local Authority Capital Finance and Accounting Scotland Regulations 2016 draft. The regulations are made under the power in section 165 of the Local Government etc. Scotland Act 1994, which enables the Scottish Ministers to make provision with respect to the powers of authorities to borrow and lend money and to establish and operate loan funds. Authorities is defined for the purpose of section 165 and includes the Strathclyde Passenger Transport Authority, the SPTA. However, authorities is defined for the purpose of the instrument as including not the SPTA, but the Regional Transport Partnership for the West of Scotland, designated as the Strathclyde Partnership for Transport, established under the Transport Scotland Act 2005. There is no narration of how the functions of the SPTA have been transferred to the West of Scotland Transport Partnership. In circumstances, narrating the transfer of functions would have been proper drafting practice. Does the committee therefore agree to draw this instrument to the Parliament's attention under the general reporting ground as there has been a failure to follow proper drafting practice? Yes. Thank you. Scotland's Adoption Register Regulations 2016 Draft. Regulation 5.6 provides that where, after information is provided under the regulation for inclusion on the Adoption Register, it is decided that the person in respect of whom the information was provided is no longer suitable to be an adoptive parent, an adoptive adoption agency must, as soon as is reasonably practicable, a. notify the Scottish Ministers of that, and b. inform the Scottish Ministers of the reason for that decision. Those requirements enable the adoption register to be brought up to date. The Scottish Government's intention is that the adoption agency, which decides that the person is no longer suitable to be an adoptive parent, must implement the re requirements of Regulation 5.6, and which agency might not be the same as the one which approves suitability. The committee may consider that the provision could be more clearly could more clearly implement that intention. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the reporting ground H, as the meaning of the regulation 5.6 could be clearer? Yes. Good. The Procurement Scotland Regulations 2016 draft. Some provisions of the regulations are made by virtue of provision in the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014, the Act, which applies to regulated procurements. Others are made by virtue of provision in the Act, which replies to regulated contracts. Yet other provisions are made by virtue of provision in the Act, which applies to regulated procurements and EU regulated procurements. And indeed, others are made by virtue of provision which applies to regulated procurements, but not those which are EU regulated. In that way, regulation 4, 6 and 12 apply to differing types of contract or procurement. However, the provisions made make no reference to a regulated procurement or regulated contract, apart from one reference in Regulation 11.1. Just correct you, 4, 6, 2, 12, rather than 4, 6 and 12, convener. I'm very grateful. Forgive me. Thank you very much indeed. You're absolutely right, and it's one of those mornings. 4, 6, 2, 12. The committee may consider that it would have been appropriate drafting practice in these circumstances to have specified in the relevant regulations as well as in the explanatory note which types of contract or procurement the regulations apply to. Alternatively, where it might be more suitable drafting, a regulation could have made reference back to the section of the Act specifying which type of contract or procurement the provision applies to. This would have helped the reader to understand the extent of the provisions. Does the committee agree, agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the general reporting ground, as there has been a failure to follow proper drafting practice? Yes. Thank you. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the assessment of energy performance of non-domestic buildings, Scotland Regulations 2016, nor the Budget Scotland Act 2015 Amendment Regulations 2016 draft. Is the committee content with these, please? Yes. 
Turn to write some three as instrument subject to negative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Local Government Pension Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-32, nor the Less Favoured Area Support Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-33, nor the Nature Conservation Scotland Act 2004, Authorised Operations Order 2016, SSI 2016-38, nor the Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Amendment Regulations 2016, SSI 2016-39, is the committee content with these, please? Yes. Okay. Agenda item four, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Local Government, etc. Scotland Act 1994, commencement number nine, order 2016, SSI 2016-31, nor the specified diseases notification amendment, Scotland order 2016, SSI 2016-41 nor the Water Act 2014, commencement number two, Scotland Order 2016, SSI 2016-48. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Yes. Good. Agenda item five, the Land and Building Transactions Tax Amendment Scotland Bill. This item is for the committee to consider the delegated powers in this bill. The timetable for considering this bill is short, which is why, with it being by, considered by the Finance Committee tomorrow therefore invited Scottish Government officials to give evidence. Uh, the committee will reflect on this evidence and agree the terms of a draft report in item 9. And I welcome Robert Buchan, who's the Land and Building Transaction Amendment Scotland team bill, bill team leader, pardon me, and Greg Walker, who's the solicitor from the Scottish Government Legal Director. Thank you very much for coming along, gentlemen, and for sitting through that preamble. Uh, well, I think we probably only have one real substantive question, and that will be put by John Mason. Hey, thanks, convener. Yes, there's one kind of main issue we wanted to raise with you, and it's around this whole question of the 40,000 uh, threshold and how that might be adjusted. So I've got a few points to make, uh, if, if you'll uh, bear with me. Um, the proposed power in paragraph 14.2 of the new Schedule 2A allows Scottish ministers to adjust the 40,000 threshold in paragraph 9.3 of that schedule. The 40,000 threshold is relevant when determining whether the additional tax will be triggered. The purchase of an additional property with a market value below this figure will not trigger the additional charge, whereas the purchase of a property worth 40,000 or more may do so. And what I think we'd like an explanation for is why it is considered appropriate for this power to be subject to the negative procedure. The committee notes that powers in the 2013 Act to adjust tax rates and bans for the ordinary LBTT charge are subject to the affirmative procedure when first exercised and thereafter to the provisional affirmative procedure. The committee considers that the power in paragraph 14.2 is a similar power in that it allows the Scottish ministers to adjust the threshold below which liability for the additional charge will not apply. And we do feel this is not an administrative point, but this is actually a change uh, in the tax rates and bans. And a kind of comparator uh, would be with the, the change where the 3%, the additional charge, can be changed. Uh, I understand that is subject to the provisional affirmative procedure, uh, not to the, the negative procedure. Generally, the committee considers that a power to adjust thresholds of t for tax liability should more properly be subject either to the affirmative or the provisional uh, affirmative procedure. So I wonder if you have any thoughts or comments on that. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Greg um, in a moment to talk about the different ways in, in which it can be varied. But just from a policy perspective, the reason that um, it was felt necessary to have the power in there to vary the 40 thousand threshold separately from the threshold to notification was that it's conceivable that Scottish ministers may want the two to diverge in future. Um, there, there may be very good reasons in the future that we're not aware of now that, for example, the threshold um, should be increased beyond 40,000 for the purposes of the supplement, and those reasons wouldn't necessarily mean that the threshold um, per se for notification should be increased. So that that's why there's two, two figures really rather than absolutely one. Yeah. 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 Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Um but from a policy perspective that's about as far as it goes for me. I don't know if, if there's anything you want to add, Greg, about the I think just very much as you'd said, we've put in the delegated powers memorandum, there's a synergy between these forty K figures which appear in 
different parts of the LBTT Act, um, the current policy is for them to be aligned. And an alternative way of reflecting that in the bill would have been to simply say, in the new Schedule 2A, the figure is the figure which you can already see in Section 30. But because, as Robert's mentioned, we need to build in flexibility for the future, we've made them severable. But I think we were very much viewing the new power in the new Schedule 2A as similar to the power in Section 30 of the bill. So that was our relevant precedent, which is subject to negative procedure. And having the same procedure applicable would mean that the two measures can be combined in a single instrument rather than having two potentially at different times subject to different procedures, but to achieve a common policy intention. Um, in terms of the point about the tax rates and bans orders always being subject to a form of affirmative procedure, that's absolutely right. Um, I would comment though that in terms of the Section 30 power, if having no regard to this bill, there was a proposal to vary the notification threshold below 40 grand or above, that would have significant legal consequences in terms of taxpayers and their agents' duties to send in return. So it might not affect whether tax is payable, but you know, it could have some impact. Um, in terms of affirmative procedure applying to the first um, rates of devolved tax, the reason it was full affirmative procedure was there were no figures on the face of the bill. There was some time between the, the first LBTT Act being passed in 2013 and then coming into effect in April 2015. Here we have an expedited legislative procedure with commencement on the face of the bill scheduled for 1st of April. So we have all the rates on the bill. So I don't think there's a comparator for full affirmative procedure. But really, for the reasons we've set out between us, we feel that negative procedure strikes the right balance. Well, I suppose I would just question that a little bit more, and then maybe one of my colleagues will want to come in as well. But I mean, I take your point there that, you know, it maybe isn't, it isn't quite the same way as we did with the full LBTT uh, legislation, and that therefore maybe that interim step of full affirmative isn't so necessary. But I would still argue that the provisional affirmative for future changes. Uh, would still be necessary because it still seems to me that when we're comparing this uh, 40,000 level, it is more like changing it is more like changing the 3% rate, uh, whereby what somebody actually pays in tax would change, uh, whereas the uh, notifi not notifiability threshold is more of an administrative thing. And I just feel it's, it's not quite the same. And while well, the point's already been made, they might not be varied together, eh, or they might be varied together, but my point would still be that the two are actually slightly different things, one being administrative and one being the actual tax. Eh, so I think I would, my preference would be, and we'll hear maybe from others in the committee, that it should be the provisional affirmative. Could, could intervene from the chair, if you forgive me. Can I say, I've heard everything you say, and I, I'm entirely with you that if it's on the face of the bill, there's no need to treat it as if it weren't. So I don't think we have any troubles with that. <coughs> the difficulty I have with the idea that the 40,000 threshold, if I may use that term, um, is negative procedure, uh, or, or, or in any way can be compared with whether or not you need to fill in a form, is quite simply because it can have very significant effects on whether or not I'm paying tax. If that number is reduced, then... I could quite simply find myself in a position where I'm now paying 3% on an entire transaction when I wasn't before. Just as simple as that. 3% on an entire transaction could be an awful lot of money. So there are real policy implications that go very much beyond anything to do with filling in a piece of paper. And it feels to me, and I think to my colleagues, very much as though it's actually a tax band. Because actually that's how it behaves. And you would set, as you have already said, tax bans by affirmative procedure, provisional or otherwise. And Mr. Buchan has already set out eloquently. The government seems feels that it does have to need, need the opportunity to have a different threshold between filling in the forms and changing the tax rates, which actually makes from your own mouth the, the reason why I think actually this particular bit should be affirmative, because it has significant effects on individuals' tax liabilities take that away and reflect on it as a bill team. Obviously, we've not followed the usual procedure where we had the benefit of your um, 
your, your input before we're asked to respond. So I think we, we'll certainly take that away and reflect. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's probably all we can ask you to do, Stuart. Um, just, just to add, I think I'm persuaded by what uh, my two colleagues have said. And though while the officials are not here to make a decision in the matter, um, I think they can now see that there would be a majority of the committee in favour of making this affirmative. John. What uh, John Mason has eloquently put to uh, government officials. Um, might I also, when I'm got, I've got the microphone, so to speak, can I just ask if I may um, a different question? Would that be acceptable? Please do. Please do. Um, I'm just wondering, um, in terms of the, the value of a property at forty thousand pounds, does whether it's tenanted or not affect? the value of it, and have you considered that or not? Um, I think I would have to say I'm not sure about that, whether or not it, it affects the, the value of a, a property around about 40,000, whether or not it's got tenants in it or not. I would imagine it probably does, but it's not been something that we've considered. Would, would it be something that you might also consider considering? <laughs> I think it would be very clear it would most certainly change the value. Yeah, yeah. It's a question of what it does to your threshold. Yes. Um, if a rule of thumb might be that a tenanted property is worth half what it might otherwise be, which would probably well, do as a workable number. In um, some it, cases. It might have a huge difference again. Sorry, I cannot be clear. That is very clearly a policy issue, which in principle we shouldn't be going anywhere near, but I'm also conscious of the timetable, so we may as well raise what we can. Stuart. Well, I, I, th I think the interesting point that John Scott has raised is perhaps not so much whether the value at the point of the transaction is changed by whether there's a tenant in place and indeed the nature of the tenancy. Um, it's perhaps more interestingly if the tenancy subsequently ceases and therefore changes the value and therefore is this a mechanism which could be open to some people in some circumstances to reduce the value by having a tenant at the point of the transaction leading rapidly thereafter to it assuming its full market value um, and thus whether this opens a tax avoidance uh, question. Now, I'm not un attempting to answer that question. I'm merely suggesting it's a question that others may wish to consider getting an answer. Might be an, I'll bring him in half a moment ago. You might be forewarning the team as to questions the Finance Committee might put to them tomorrow morning, bearing in mind that two members of that committee are sitting here at the moment. Mr Walker, did you want to comment? Just a technical comment, and obviously we'll take away all these points, but the nature of LBTT is there are various points at which there is a financial threshold, so this question is not a new question or one that isn't irrelevant as to whether you hit the 145 grand threshold at which starts being payable or the threshold beyond that at which you, you move into a different tax band. It's not a new question, but we'll certainly have yeah. a think about that. Okay. Right. Do we have any other questions on the particular issues in front of us, Joe? I mean, the, it's, a, it's just a daft laddy question, but I mean, it, the, the value subject to vacant possession would be an easy way of describing it, uh, or not. And I just would ask you to reflect on it. Okay. Thank you, John. I think, I think, thank you, gentlemen. I, th I think that probably takes us as far as we need to go this morning. Thank you for that. And I'll briefly suspend this meeting to enable folk to move away. Resuming, thank you very much. That brings us to agenda item six, which is the Budget Scotland number five bill. This item is for the committee to consider the delegated powers provisions in the bill. 
The Bill confers one delegated power set out in Section 7 of the Bill, which makes provision for budget revision regulations. This power is subject to the affirmative procedure. Does the Committee agree to report that it is satisfied with the power in Section 7 of the Bill and that its exercise is subject to the affirmative procedure? Yes. Well, thank you. Agenda item 7, the Burial and Cremation Scotland Bill. This item of business is for the Committee to consider the Scottish Government's response to its Stage 1 reports. Do members have any comments? Uh, convener, I think uh, we should properly welcome the response from the government. Um, it, it, it certainly wasn't clear that the bill is, uh, as laid and the processes that we had to consider as a committee related to the way in which one might have imagined uh, funeral directors go about their business, which is most certainly not wholly conducted within a single premise uh, that they might have often in the premises of others the premises of the bereaved, for that matter. Uh, so I think we should properly welcome this and uh, uh, pat ourselves gently on the back with our legal advisors for uh, effecting this uh, proposed set of changes. Right. Tom. Uh, yes, I mean, I do agree with that. I think the, the premises, uh, the business, sorry, is much better uh, to be licensed than the uh, premises. I think there remains a concern that um, the whole licensing regime is subject to um, regulations and is not at all in the face of the bill, whereas normally we might have expected you know, the bulk of it to be in the face of the bill and then a bit of room for tweaking round the edges. Um, so perhaps, say, when we, get to, we do get to the debate, that that point could be made as well as, I agree with Stuart, congratulating the changes that uh, have been made and so on. Thank you. Um, I would agree with my colleagues too. Um, their responses are perhaps a little more predictable. But um, without taking any particular side, I would welcome also the fact that the government has made radical changes to the bill as laid in many, many areas which were uh, not just to be welcomed but essential. And um, I congratulate our uh, advisors on on their scrutiny and of the bill and drawing to the government's attention the, the many weak spots uh, and uh, the welcome the government's intention to improve hugely on what was what was laid. Is, is the committee then content to note the response and to consider the powers as amended at stage two? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Which brings us to agenda item eight, which is the Carers Scotland Bill. This item is for the committee to consider the delegated powers provisions in the bill as amended at stage two. There are five new or substantially amended powers in the bill after stage two. Uh, does the committee agree to report that it is content with the new or substantially amended delegated powers as amended at stage two? Yes. We are. Thank you very much. That completes item eight, and I now move this meeting into private. Thank you.